All right, are you ready to overcome all the other objections you may have in your business? Well, today, Rachel and I finish out our objection busting series with episode number four. Now, this was a really fun episode. We actually go down a rabbit hole on different things, including relationships, what makes it a successful relationship, what our relationships look like with our spouses and how they're really expansive and, and not so limiting. And the reason why we got on that topic is because we do address how to overcome the objection of the spouse, including like how to, how to coach your people to coach their spouses to say yes and all sorts of stuff. It's, it's, it was a really fun episode. It's a very loose sort of structure and we go down many rabbit holes and tangents and it's just packed with a lot of information, both in sales objections and personal life. So um, if that sounds interesting to you, well, keep on listening. Hi, I'm Brandon Lucero and you're about to experience the new way to thrive in business, entrepreneurship and life by leaning into who you are, what you love, and standing up for what you want to create. Get ready, because this is where we go against the grain, say no to outdated society norms, and we say yes to change in order to create a happier, more fulfilled world. Welcome to the New Generation Entrepreneur Podcast. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the New Generation Entrepreneur Podcast. This episode is... Number four of our objection busting series. This is the last and final one. And I have Rachel, my co-host here with me. Rachel, how's it going? Howdy. So good. Uh, all right. Well, so for this last episode, we're kind of talking beforehand. What do we want to cover? What objections? And honestly, I think like through the last two episodes, even though the topic was money and time, we kind of like segued into a lot of different ones and kind of addressed a lot of those. So what we're going to do is just kind of go through a couple of things that just popped up um, that we thought might be beneficial to either go through again or that we haven't addressed. And the first one was talking about, um, well, first let's, let's, let's talk about the expectations and the follow-up first, actually, Rachel, um, okay. which was something that I brought up and I wanted to address with you guys is kind of set the expectations of objection busting that although we're helping you and we will greatly improve your close rate by, you know, it, you will imp improve your close rate and objection busting by listening to and practicing what we're, we're talking about, but it's not going to work 100% of the time. You're still going to have people that like are really in their stuff or really just like want to think about it, or they make decisions slower than other people or whatever it might be. So the expectation I want to set is that like, this is not going to work 100% of the time. What we're looking for is, can we just improve your close ratio? Number one, number two, you have to also understand that a lot of the times, uh, if they still have the problem and can't get it solved, like they're going to come back, which is means that follow up, I believe will probably bring you about 50% of your sales. Like it, it should, if, if you're doing 10 sales a month right now, if you do prop proper follow up in a couple months, you should be doing 20 sales. It should double what you do. However, the expectation again, that I want to set, um, is that when you follow up, you have to understand your, your first objection busting efforts do not go unnoticed or in vain. Like they're still effective because a lot of these people that you have conversations with, you will have a second conversation and a third conversation. And if you've already tackled the, the objection, the likelihood of it coming up or being as intense is not, it's just not going to be the same. It might not even come up at all. So remember expectations, you're not going to close everyone. Even if you do, you want to follow up. And then when you follow up, the objection busting you did earlier still has an effect on call number two or three. Um, anything you want to add to that, Rachel? Yeah, there's a couple of things that I, I want us to remember as it comes to expectations. Part of what you need to know in your own business, and for everyone, this is going to be different, but you need to understand the length of your sales cycle. So some people are going to buy, you're going to put out, let's say you put out an ad for a download, people will download, you'll get them on a call, they'll close and enroll in your program. And that's going to take maybe seven days. Most people though, are not going to be those people. Most people need a longer sales cycle with you. And what that means is what Brandon said, it's the follow-up. That is a crucial key component of your sales cycle. So when the call is over and someone didn't close on the call, it's not the end of your sales cycle. It's the beginning of the follow-up piece. So that's something you guys all need to remember that even if you did the best job in the world overcoming objections, you still have to take into account the length of your own sales cycle in your business. So that's one thing. 
And the other thing, I know we talk about this a lot in the context of messaging, that there are invisible elements to messaging. And I know you, I'm pretty sure you did a podcast episode about this. There are also invisible elements to a sales call. And one of them is how you show up. Your energy on the sales call determines how you handle objections. It determines how you position your offer, how you, how it lands with the prospect. So if you're, you have to be really quote unquote clean with how you showed up on that call, not bringing all the things that are going on in your personal life or the 10 calls that you didn't close prior to this call or whatever it is, right? We all have things we deal with. So it's really important for you to be aware of the fact that there are closing a call, uh, being successful on a sales call, there is more than just strategy, just like messaging is more than just strategy. Yeah, 100%. Um, And it's true, like when you have conversations with people and they're just kind of like this and boring, looking down at the ground, like you're not going to be very engaged and they can say the exact same words, but be like this and enthusiastic and it's going to completely change the dynamic of the conversation. So hundred percent. I was um, I was just having a, a discussion about this with someone who got the objection that I know you and I talked about, but they got the objection of, well, I'm enrolled in a bunch of other courses. Right now is not the right time. We talked about this a couple episodes ago. Right. And to me, when I hear I'm enrolled in multiple programs, to me, I'm thinking perfect. This person is perfect because they understand the importance of investing in business. They're already on that path. They already are in the energy of, I need to do something. So when I look at that person, I'm not thinking, oh, this is not going to close. I'm not buying into that perspective of, oh, they have too many courses on their plate. I'm coming at it from the opposite perspective of, this is perfect. You're perfectly positioned to further your um, you know, your understanding to get more mentorship, to get more results. Mm. So <clears throat> what do you say to them? To the prospect? Yeah. I know, and I know we covered this in a past, in the past episodes, but let's just dive into it again. What do you, someone says, I can't join. I'm enrolled in like this program and this program. What do you do? So I first ask, how is that going? Right. What is their experience in these programs? Is, are they delivering results? Is there something missing in these programs? that maybe I can highlight about our program. So I, I, I kind of have to do a bit of a discovery on how this process is going for them. And if they, usually they will uncover that, yeah, I mean, it's going, I don't know, I'm trying, I'm implementing, there's some support. Then I make a mental note because I know this is going to come back to me later in an objection, right? So uh, so for me, I I position the pieces of our program that are, different from everything else they're enrolled in right now. I position the fact that I I shift out of the belief that I can't do another program or another mentorship because I'm already invested in something else. I, I shift out of that because it's not about how many programs you're in. It's about, do you have the results you need? Right. I do something similar and I actually sparked an idea as I was listening to you talk, um, was that too, I think finding out the details of that program would be really helpful too. Like if the program is not a time-based program and they have lifetime access, well then what's, you can always go back to it at any point. So like if someone came to me and was like, well, we're already in business by design, like James's program. Mm -hmm. It's like, that's great. This, this will amplify business by design and there's no time on business. You have that for the rest of your life. So if it were me, I'd rather get the messaging figured out first and then go back to business by design because there is no time limit. So finding out the time limit too, there might not even be a time limit on that program and you can move them out of that as well. So I like that. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, Okay. So the other objection that we thought we should address is the spouse objection or business partner objection. So I'll start it off by saying like this also, this like this one, well, let me put it this way. The thing that you hopefully have realized through the course of the series is that when you overcome an objection, it doesn't happen when the objection comes up. And I think that's how most people handle it. Meaning that when someone says, oh, I can't because of X, Y, and Z, the majority of people start thinking, how do I overcome the objection now? 
And if you're doing that, you already lost. Over, you have to anticipate the objections and then put that in the discovery phase. So if you know the spouse thing is coming up, very simply in the discovery phase, you ask, how do you make decisions in, in the business? Do you talk to your spouse? Do you have a business partner? And you wait to see what they say. Um, what I like to do is if they say, yeah, I always make decisions with my spouse or my business partner, I always ask, well, what happens if it's something you know you need? And they say, no, what do you do? And then they would say, well, I'd probably just do it anyways. Or they'll say, well, then I just don't do it. And then now you, have, now you change the subject to, well, why don't you do it? you're going to let your spouse or your business partner just dictate the success of your program or whatever it may be or whatever. And you start to overcome it. Now, again, you're not overcoming the objection there, but you're gaining the material or the insight that you need to overcome the objection if it does come up at the end. And sometimes if you do a good discovery, it doesn't even come up at all. Because if you just say like, what are you going to, what if they say no, what are you going to do? And they're like, oh, I'm going to just do it anyway. It's like, okay, cool. Yeah, I like that mentality. That's what I do, did as well, blah, blah, blah. And then when you do the offer, like they already know what they said. So the chances of them saying, oh, I'm going to need to ask my spouse is probably going to be unlikely. But is there anything that you do that's different than that, Rachel? I, I love that direction. I do think there is a, the vast majority of time when people bring up the partner objection, it's, it's not so much an objection. It's more of, you know, I'm about to drop a huge sum and for, you know, for them. And I just, out of respect, I want to check in with my partner before I do that, which is fine. That's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. There is a small percentage of people who will say, no, I actually need my partner's permission. So th I think it's good for us to know which one it is. And certainly depending on, on your niche, it might be more of a permission thing rather than uh, just out of respect I want to check in with my partner. So you need to be, you need to know kind of how involved are the partners in this decision for your prospect, because if it is a permission thing, then I think the question you ask is really powerful. Well, what if they say no? Now they, you ask permission, they say no. So this means what for you? How are you going to work through that? And will you take, Will you, will you let me kind of help you position it to your partner, talk to your partner? Will you help me? Will you let me coach you through what to say to your partner to get their permission? Right. I want to dive into that, but this is more like, I'm going to go off on a little bit of a tangent. <clears throat> um, inside of your relationship, if there's something like you want to do, yeah. And you want to do, and you need to do, and he says, no. What do you do? So that scenario never comes up because I never ask. <laughs> <laughs> so, and take this with a grain of salt, right? Everyone has their own relationship, but in my life and in my world, I make decisions, even if they are big money decisions, even if they impact other people, I make decisions kind of unilaterally. And I will say my husband also does. So we both know we have, quote unquote, permission to make decisions unilaterally. Now, I will, I'll say this, right? That doesn't mean that either one of us is going to drain all the bank accounts and go buy a yacht, you know? It's not like that, right? We have, we have some basic understandings there. But when it comes to investing in my business, you think my husband knows any of the investments I've made? I've invested tens of thousands of dollars in mentors. My husband okay. doesn't know any of it. Let me re-ask the question then. Cause there's always going to be a price point where that conversation is going to need to come up. I would yeah. feel like, so $10,000, I'm willing to bet you're, you're just doing it. A yep. hundred thousand dollars. Are you still just doing it or are you talking to him? I'd probably talk to him out of respect. Okay. And he says, no, what do you do? But you know, it's what you need. Well, I think part of it is how you position that question. I don't ask permission. I say, this is where I'm at in my business. I've done the due diligence. This is my next step. This is my next step. It's going to cost a hundred thousand dollars. This is, this is my plan for where that money is going to come from. This is my plan for how I'm going to make it back. Yeah. Not so asking what, permission. Right. So where I'm going with this is like, you would still, you would build a case for why you need to do it. 
Yes. Um, yeah. And I, for me, I'm like, I, I think if I asked and she said, no, I think I would do it anyways. Yeah, and I, I would too. De- but depending on the, depending on the price, I think it, again, it comes down to the price point of like, right. So if it were a hundred thousand dollars, would you talk to your wife? Oh yeah. 10,000. No, 20,000. No, 30, yeah. maybe 40, maybe, but like a hundred for sure. Um, so this brings me to my, my next point is like, you've done this on sales calls with people where they're like, I need to talk to my husband and you've coached them on what, how to position this to their husband. Do you remember how you do that? Like how you coach people to, to pitch it to their spouse? So I had this woman on a sales call and she really wanted to enroll in the program, really wanted. And she knew it was the right thing for her. And she was like two feet in, but literally she was on like a, you could say she was on an allowance. Her husband was the breadwinner. She was not making any money in the relationship. So he was funding everything and she needed his permission. Right. So. Which makes sense. There's probably like budgets they have to do, go through and all that stuff. And like our stuff's not cheap. So. Right. You know, and I'm sure like for anyone listening, that situation can come up for you too. And this is kind of what we're saying is like, sometimes there's the smoke screen. Sometimes there's the real actual issue. Right. And what Rachel's talking about is not a smoke screen. This is the real actual issue. Right. And so to be fair, I did ask the question of, are we talking about money that otherwise would go to paying the electricity bill? Or are we just talking about, you know, this is, we have the money, but I still need his permission. And she said, no, it's, we've got our bills covered more. Most likely we have the money on the credit card, on his credit card. It's more a permission thing. So I said, okay. So knowing that I coached her on, I coached her on how to communicate to him. What is her deeper purpose? Why she wants to do this, why this is important for her, how this is going to translate into their relationship what she's asking of him really, because she's not just asking for 10 grand or however much it is. What she's asking is trust. And she went to him and she said word for word what I told her. And in real time, she texted me what he said. I didn't expect that. I didn't know. I just happened to be on my phone as I am a lot. And she, and I see the text come through. It's like 9 PM my time. This text come through and she says, this is what he said. And I was like, okay, I'm going to give you the words to say back right now. (laughs) (laughs) I was like, listen, he's a good guy. Okay. He's a good guy. He loves you. Like I could tell by his response, he wasn't being a jerk. Right. He's a good guy. He just needs to feel like this is, you know, a partnership and you're going to be accountable. Do you remember what he said with that text said? I don't, I don't remember Mm. what he said, but he was. I think he wanted more to know that this wasn't just a frivolous thing. He wanted to know, um, not, not so much details of our program, by the way. He wanted to know that she was going to be accountable for herself, that she was going to stand up for herself and fight for herself. Interesting. I, to be honest with you, like I would have the same concerns. I did have the same concerns because Jacqueline just signed up for a program and um, – you know, it wasn't very expensive. It was only 1500 bucks, but, but she was like, do you think I should sign up for it? This is what I really want to do. Like, cause the kids are leaving the house. It's like her new direction of where she wants to go. And like $1,500, like where we're at now financially, just, it, I didn't, I wouldn't even have noticed if it was gone or whatever. It's just like, it's not, it wasn't a ton of money, but my biggest thing was biggest concern was like, are you going to actually follow through with this? Because if you're not going to, I'm like, I, it's $1,500. We're not, we're going to be totally fine if we lose it, but I want to make sure you actually do it. Cause otherwise it's just a waste of money. And so I totally understand that, that concern. And I'm assuming she, she convinced them and said, yeah. Well, so I, I coached her through how to communicate that she's taking full accountability for how she shows up in the program, for getting her results, for making the money back. Like this is on her. And, um, and, you know, she's in the program. So proof is in the pudding. She cried. She cried literally when she said what I told her to say. And he said, yes, she started, she sobbed. She left me a voice message sobbing of relief. That's why I so said this is such a great example to go into because I think so many people feel like objection busting. Like I said, we talked about the manipulative thing and it's, 
it's not. It's like these people really want to do it. And there's so many things in the way, whether it's the husband or their own limiting beliefs. And you have to fight for them. Like you really do. Because we could have very easily gone like, yeah, go to talk to your husband. And, right. and then boom, we lose the sale. And it's like, no, right. we're like fighting for the sales, fighting for you to get into the program. And to the point where like they're crying because they're so happy. It's just right. a beautiful, beautiful thing. So, but, but, you know, it goes both ways. Like I always say this, and, and this is true for all of us who are coaches, I mean, I'm the first one to fight for my clients, but I can't fight more than my clients are willing to fight. I can't want results more than you want them for yourself. And this woman, I just sensed she was willing to fight for herself. So I was like, okay, then I'm in it with you. I'm in the trenches with you. I'm going to show you how to fight. This should be like, this could be like a bonus we offer in our program. It's like scripts on how to convince your, <laughs> your spouse or how to coach your own clients to get their spouse on board or something like that. Um, totally. <laughs> so there's another thing that we do here, which is what we learned from our, our, um, our sales mentor, um, which is get the, get the spouse on the call. So if they do make decisions and all of that stuff, it's like, well, let's book a second call. And let's get them on the call. And then also we have our, ben, our setter, Ben, who's calling a lot of the leads we have and stuff and getting them to have calls with us. And if he uncovers like that information, he can be like, okay, let's set a call that works for you and your partner. You get both of them on the call. That's the ultimate goal to overcome this objection is if you find out beforehand or you find out and you're not going to be able to overcome it, don't even leave it up to them. Like see if you can get both of them on another call and then you go through again. Um, it was really interesting because there was an example that I think I, it was a call that you had and mm -hmm. I didn't even pick up on this. I, I know you yeah. didn't, but then right. our sales mentor picked up on it. He said, every time she answers one of your questions, she looks at the husband right. for his approval on the answer. And, right. you never, and we didn't talk to the husband at all. We kept right. talking to her. Right. And he was like, he's the decision maker. You, we should oh. next time you talk to them the entire time. Right. And so this is part of why it's so good to do these sales calls on Zoom. I know a lot of people do sales calls on the phone and I, I understand. I understand why. Like I get it. It's more anonymous and it's easier for the prospects. A lot of people don't want to get on Zoom. I'm not, you know, I'm in my pajamas. I don't have my makeup on, whatever. I get that. And it's a lost opportunity because as we all know, 90% of communication is nonverbal. So that means, yes, it means that we have a higher standard that we have to meet, right? We have to be really clear on our nonverbal communication. That's what, what I was saying earlier about the energy that you show up with, right? But also it gives us an opportunity to gauge where the prospect is at. So I completely missed the fact, I, I missed who was the true decision maker here. I, I missed it. And I, and we lost that we lost that sale, right? So this is why this is so important. You have to know, you have to, and you have to recognize, oh, here's where I missed an opportunity. What can I learn from this so I can apply it next time? Right. I don't think we lost that sale. No, I think not we, yet. I think we delayed that sale. Yes, we did. And that's the other thing too, is like, sometimes you just have to let people go yeah. knowing that they just got to learn their lesson. You know, we had, we had someone who actually we were talking about before the call, who right. I, I, you had a conversation with like in probably mm -hmm. November of last year yeah, or something or, like that or December or something yeah. or beginning of the year. Yeah. Like it's been months. And then I had a conversation with the person. Right. And then they were so convinced that they just needed a Facebook ads person. And I said, I, I, and then I'm like, how much are you spending a month? They're like $10,000 between like ad spend and this person. And I was like, I don't, I, I like, look, I'm not trying to sell my program. I'm not saying this to try to make a sale. I don't think you should do that. If you're, you, they, cause they built a really organic audience, but warm organic messaging does not translate to cold direct response ads. It just doesn't, you gotta be very careful what you're doing. And I remember telling her that I'm like, I don't think I would be doing this if I were you, it's gonna be cost you thousands of dollars and we can fix the messaging side first. And then we can go there and we already know what's going to work and we can get the ads working that way. And they're like, no, I think I'm going to do this. Da, 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 da. It's like, okay. Lo and behold, two months later, they reach out again. And I'm like, how did the ads person work out? And they're like, yeah, it didn't really go that well. I'm like, uh-huh. <laughs> so you have to just let them sometimes too, if you can't overcome those objections, just, all right, go and do that. I'm going to follow up with you in like two months to see how it's going. And then 
if it's still the same issue, it's like, okay, are we ready now to like actually do this? Or are you just going to keep doing the same thing for another two months? So, um, something you can do too. Um, okay. Anything else on the spouse one in particular you want to go through? We talked about getting the partner on the phone, answering those questions in the discovery, coaching the spouse on, on, um, what they can do. Anything else you want to. I think just, a re- just kind of to f- close that loop of, Sometimes people feel uncomfortable asking to reschedule with the spouse. The reason for that is because the prospect is never going to to explain your program to the spouse better than you can. So keep it in your own hands. Keep maintain the leadership of the call by having the spouse come and be able to directly ask, bring up their objections, right? The spouse is going to have objections too. So it just gives you the opportunity to handle them where you think the prospects are going to be able to handle objections. No, they're not. And even that, like you can even coach the prospect on how to get the spouse. Cause sometimes the spouses are gonna be like, Oh no, I don't like, that's stupid. I don't need to be on that. Blah, blah, blah. Um, I, I love the, like, here's, I like, here's what I'm dealing with. So if Jacqueline came to me and was like, here's my situation. Um, I'm feeling this, I'm feeling frustrated because of that. I feel like there's something more I'm not living my purpose. I lost, and this is what she did. She's like, I lost my identity. Like, because it came up stay at home mom. And she's like, I'm just feeling, and she just went to how I'm feeling. And she's like, here's what I've tried. And I can't like figure this out. And I found a solution and I would love for you to be on the call. You don't have to, you don't have to say price point or anything like that. Um, I'd love for you to be on the call to hear more about it. Like, that's how I would coach a prospect is like, talk about what, what you're feeling why you're frustrated, what you've tried that hasn't worked and that you found a solution and you would just want their support on the call. It's like a good way to coach your people on getting the spouse onto the, onto the call. Right. Um, okay. Anything else there? Should we move on to the next one? Also uh, just one thing, like what you just said, just brought it up for me specifically around if you have an offer that's not an ROI based offer, but it's uh, like health or relationships or something like that. Part of your success depends on your partner's support at home. Like you do need to have your partner support you on your self-development journey. If you're working on a relationship or you're working on your health or your, your mental health or whatever it is, actually getting the buy-in of your partner is part of your success. So it is really important. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's really freaking hard to be successful when you're in an environment where the people that are close to you don't support you really hard. I mean, I just can't imagine, like, I only see it going one of three ways. Either you don't go after it and keep them happy. You go after it. Um, and they get pissed and they leave. And that's where I would say most of most people go in either one of those two directions. Number three is you go after it, they're pissed in the beginning, and then they like open up to the idea. That's me and my husband. Really? I go after it. I don't care if he's pissed or not pissed, but sometimes he's been pissed. Yeah. Sometimes he's been pissed about investments I made, about directions I took without asking, about, you know, decisions I made. He does sometimes like not agree. And then I'm like, okay. Is there an example you can share? You know what? Or me just being nosy and and curious. Yeah. You know me, I don't care. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, like even the, the decision. So when my husband and I got married, I had been working in corporate for my whole life and I'd been making a lot of money. And we both made the conscious decision that when we have kids, I'd be a stay-at-home parent, which I did. And I did that for about seven years until my my boys were seven, my daughter was six, everyone was in school like kindergarten or first grade. She was in first grade, maybe. And then um, I thought I was going to be a stay-at-home mom forever. Like that was the plan and that was the agreement. And then when the kids went to school, I had this, this feeling that had been building up over a few years, but I felt I'm not done. I'm not done with work. I'm not done. There's still like, I still have like another good egg in me. You know what I mean? And I said, listen, I'm going to start a business. And he was not on board with that. Not because he didn't want me to have a business, but because he knew this is going to take away from the kids and that's either going to fall on him or we're going to have to hire 
more help or like something's something's got to give, right? And the first few years, I would say the first two, not few, maybe the first, uh, definitely the first year, maybe even the first two years of owning my own online coaching business. You know how it is. We all know how it is. Lots of ups and downs. Lots of things didn't go the way I wanted them to go. And he was skeptical and not, not happy about it. And I was like, okay, just that's okay. Be skeptical, be unhappy, be pissed. I'm okay with that. I'm doing my thing. And now where I am, if you ask him, he would say, this has made you going back to work and, you know, living what, living your purpose, helping people, being a coach, doing what you do, working with the people that you work with has lit you up. You are so happy. It spills over into everything else you do. You're ecstatic when you're a mom, you're ecstatic getting up in the morning. Like you have such good energy. So now he's completely flipped. Mm, I love that. Yeah. I'm, I think I'm, I'm kind of in the same boat now. Um, as far as decision-making goes, like in the past, um, I was very, I would say, I guess controlled is the right word, controlled by what I thought her reaction would be. So like, oh, I'm not going to do that because she's going to get pissed. And now, and that's just, for me, that's just an example of like a leak of personal power. And I'm at the point now where I'm like, I just have so much more personal power then. And also attachment issues too, where I'm kind of like, I'm at the point where like, I'm going to live the life that I want to live. And if like my partner's not on board with that, I'm not, I'm not attached. Like I'm, I'm, I'm unattached to whatever happens. So like, if she's like, I don't want to do this business thing and da, 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 I'm leaving. Like, yeah, so be it. And if, if she's like, you know, and I also think that like, and that's also the, not, if it was that way, that's not the relationship I want. It's not like you do what I want you to do. Otherwise I'm leaving. Like, I don't want that really. It's so like boxed off and closed off, but it's also on the flip side. I have to do the same thing for her too. Yes. So, yes. <laughs> so it's like, sometimes she'll do things. And I'm like, oh, I don't really want to spend money on that or I'm like, whatever, but like, Nope. I, gotta, I was in that go. exact, I was in that position too. I was like, okay, now I have to eat my own, my yeah. own thing. Right. Like, because my husband has been, when we got married, you know, before we got married, I should not before we got married, but before we had children, we lived this amazing life, right? We owned a boat. We had these gorgeous sports cars. Like he was, he was living the dream. And then we had kids. And as everyone knows, everything changes. We got rid of the boat. We got rid of the sports cars in favor of, you know, like these giant SUVs with three children, three, you know, car seats across, like everything is kid, 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 kid. Right. And in his heart, he was still missing his sports car. Now I personally, I don't miss it. I don't miss that life, but he does. And he still was pining for this like two seat convertible, two seat, very expensive convertible. And finally I was like, you know what, man, just go get it, go get the car, get it's like, it's just for you. Nobody else. Like, I, I don't like convertibles because I don't like wind in my hair. It's just for you, but you go get it and you go enjoy it every single day of your life. And it was a lot of money. And I had to just sit there and be like, wow, I can think of 5 million things I would rather do with that money right now. But there it is. But it's such an expansive relationship. And now we're getting off on a way big tangent, but whatever. <laughs> um, because that's one of the rules that we have in our relationship is, is it's always it's never a no. It's always a yes, but it's, but it's, but you have to be realistic with it. So it's, if it's a, it might be a yes, but not right now because we can't. So let's come up with a plan, but it's never like, no, you can't do that. Or you're not allowed to do that. Or you're not, whatever. It's like, if you want that, then let's like, we're, I'm on board with that. Let's go, let's go do that. Right. And, um, and I think like a lot of, and in order to get that place, you have to be so unattached. We're like, yes. Don Javier always says to me, care about everything and care about nothing at this same exact moment. Yeah. And that's what unattachment is, is like, I care about my family and our relationship so much, but if it all falls apart, I'm also okay with that. And that allows us to have a very expansive relationship because everyone gets what they want all the time and no one's ever said no. And it's, it's very like weird because people think, Oh, I got to be attached and say no. And da, da, da. And it's like, God, you live such a constricted life and relationship. I wouldn't last in a relationship like that. Five minutes. I wouldn't last five minutes. And, and I see other people in relationships like that. And I don't know how they make it work for them. Like 
you know, more power to them. I'm, I'm not judging it, but I'm just saying I know myself. If I ever get a whiff of a feeling that I'm being controlled or boxed in or limited in any way, I'm out before you can even finish the sentence. Yeah. Yeah, I'm the same way. It wasn't always like that, but through the growth that we've had, I'm there now. I wouldn't want it any other way. In the same way, like, I don't, especially if I, like, if you get to the point where you're with your spouse and you guys have kids, and let's just say you start a new relationship and you don't have kids, like, my God, if there was an ounce of that, it's like, see ya. Yeah. <laughs> like, I would work through it a little bit. Right, like, you like, way out. <laughs> I would express my opinions or feelings and, you know, see yeah. if you can work towards it, but I, I'm still going to go do it. And if they can't handle that, then I don't know. Right. And so my, my husband says, says it in a much nicer way than you and I are saying it right now. Like you and I are like, yeah, forget it. I'm out. If that ever happens, I'm out. And my husband says he feels like his primary job in life is to make, is to facilitate and ensure that all of my personal goals and dreams become a reality especially the ones he's not on board with. And I'm like, dude, like, thank you. I love that. And, and I've obviously vice versa too. And so one of my, I know this is totally off topic, but one of my childhood dreams was to have a dog. Ever since I was a little girl, I've wanted a dog, like dying to have a dog. My parents didn't get me a dog for a million reasons. And I said to him like three years ago, I was like, listen, I still feel this way. Like at the time I was, you know, I was 46 or 47. I was like, for 47 years, I've been feeling like this. And he said, and he did, did not want a dog. I, he grew up with dogs. He was like, this is a big pain in the butt. We don't need. I'm your husband, by the way, in that, <laughs> in that scenario. Cause that was us <laughs> a year ago. And I, and I said, listen, like I'm, I, the, the little girl in me, the five-year-old Rachel in me is dying for a dog. And he said, okay, what dog? And I was like, this breed. And he was like, all right, do it. Go get it. I, I, and for the record, the dog is his dog. Right. Yeah. That dog it's, worships it's, the ground he walks on. That's usually what happens. So we had the exact same conversation. Our, our dog passed away. And for 13 years, I took care of that dog, even though Jacqueline said that she was not going to, or sorry, sorry, said that she was going to, but she did not. And that dog became mine for, for 13 years, walking every day, feeding, taking care of, cleaning up poop every day. That was my responsibility. Um, dog passed away like a year and a half ago. She wanted another dog a year ago. And like, first was like, no, like we just moved. There's too much, whatever. And again, it wasn't a no. It was like a, okay, but not right now. And then it like came up next month and I was like, all right, fine. It was like the last thing I wanted. I said, I'm not doing the goddamn thing. Like you pick up the poop, you like bring out the pee in the morning, you do the potty training. And then, um, that dog, although I, it, like if the dog got lost tomorrow, I'm, I'm good. I'm not emotionally attached to the dog, but that dog follows me around. Like it's like, I'm, it's like yeah. tail. Like, it's just like, yeah. I'm, I'm just follows me around all the, all the time. Same with I, my dog. The, the only time he gives me a, the time of day is if my husband's not home, which is a lot. But when my husband is at home, forget it. Like everyone else is invisible. Right. Well, I want to be clear on this topic too, before we get back into the objection busting. Um, at least my perspective on it is when like everything's a yes, that there's, that's within reason too. Like, you know, you still have to make decisions that are respectful for the family and things like that. Like, for example, if I was like, Hey, I want to be able to like sleep with as many other women as I want. And you cannot restrict my life and tell me no, like, no, that's a, that's a pretty big kind of like lack of respect towards the other person. So everything is always kind of like the decisions I make is always respectful to the other person as well. So it's, I'm not going to bring up these like stupid things like that, you know, or or like something that's going to put us in danger. Like, Hey, I want to just buy this like $5 million house that we can't afford. I don't care what you say. I'm going to go do it. Like, I don't do that. Like thing, the decisions and the yeses are more of like, here's what my Dharma is, my purpose. Here's the things I like to go do. I want to go do those things, but it's not, it doesn't come out of, doesn't put my family in danger and it doesn't come out of a lack of respect. I, I totally agree with that. Although if my husband came to me and said, I want to sleep with as many women as I want to sleep with, I would say, yes, go ahead and do that. But I am not staying in this marriage. Oh, I see. So you, but then, so I mean, you, you want to do that? Go ahead. Doors open. Right. But I, I'm also allowed to make decisions based off of that. That's my uh, boundary cross. Yeah. I'm out. 
but right. you go ahead. Right. Yeah, I can see that. So you're making decisions. Uh, you're not constricting decisions, but then you're making a decision on if you want that in a partner as well. Makes total sense. Yeah. Uh, okay, great. Let's get back to um, objection. Busting. I feel like we just did like a whole other separate podcast episode. Um, I, I was thinking, how do we get on this topic? And then I remember. Like, I don't know. Spouse, spouse objection. Yes. That's what the, it was. Spouse, the spouse took us down the rabbit hole. Listen, yeah. we've been known to go down rabbit holes. Okay. Yeah. And that was a good one. I think that was like super helpful. Um, a good conversation to have. So the next objection that we have here is how do I know it's going to work for me? Um, I know we talked about this one already too, but I'll just let you kind of take away, take it away. And then I'll, I'll add my two cents to it at the end. So this one is what I view as my own biggest growth opportunity because it's not my favorite objection. And that's why I say I got, I have to grow somehow into this objection to start liking it more. The reason I say it's not my favorite is because this is an uncertainty that the prospect has in their own ability. And that's hard to overcome on a sales call. Well, it could be your the lack of trust in your ability to solve the problem too, right? I don't know. I think if the process itself is, if I'm think, I'm trying to put myself in the shoes of that prospect, if what you're saying, if I trust you in your ability to deliver the program, and if I trust the program, when I say, how do I know is it going to work for me? I feel like what really is underlying there is, I don't know if I can do it. It all sounds great, Brandon. You're amazing. Your program sounds great, but I don't know if I can do it. So I try to keep it very simple and surface level in that on that objection. And I just say, listen, if you can, well, this, this process has been tried and true over, you know, thousands of students. We have hundreds of testimonials to back that up. So if the process worked for all these people, sometimes like I'll, I'll be humorous about it. I'll be like, so what, so like you're the one unlucky duck that it's not going to work for, or why would it not work for you if it's, if it's worked over and over across niches, across, you know, levels of revenue, across countries, across cultures, right? There's so many, uh, in our case, right? If you're brand new, then you might not have as many, as much proof, but for us, there is all this proof. So to me, if you can commit to following a process and if you can raise your hand when you get stuck, cause I'm expecting you to get stuck and you can be coachable, why would it not work for you? Right. That's good because um, the way I handle it, it's a little bit differently, is a little different, but it's the same, it's the same uh, sort of, I guess, tactic for lack of a better word, which is you're moving them away from the question. And, and I think where most people go is, let me just directly answer the question. It's like, well, I know it's going to work for you because we have one-on-one -on -one coaching and then we have this and then we have that. And then we, ha and then it's like, okay, cool. You're, you're already lost if that's what you're doing. So for you, it, you go like, here's, here's all the proof, which is still kind of a logical sort of thing overcome, which I think if you just said, well, here's all the proof and stopped it. I don't think that would work, but you go one step further, which is like, so you think you're going to be the one unlucky person that this doesn't work for when there's like hundreds of people that it has worked for. Some of them are already in your space. You're saying you're going to be that one person where I go with it is, um, and I know I talked about this already, but I go to the guarantee of what happens if they don't do it. So I said, you know, and I always, I just, I always lean into objections. I find one of the easiest ways that overcome objections sometimes is leaning into them. Yeah. So they, 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 exact, they exact. Yeah. Cause they expect resistance. Yes. So if they're like, how do I know that this is going to work for me? I go, you don't, you have no idea that this is going to work for you. Chances are it's going to help it's worked for a lot of different people. But I said, but the one thing that I know for absolute sure guarantee is that if you don't do it, you're just going to continue on the same path. Like if you don't change anything or do anything differently, it's going to continue. And we all know that messaging is the issue. You can agree to that, right? Yeah. So the question isn't about, is it going to work for you? The question is, is like, who are you going to go to to fix this? And if it's not me and there's someone else better out there, go for it. But if it is me, then like, what are we doing here? You know, that's, that's kind of where I go with it all. I really like that. Um, I really like that. I think that's really good. Cause again, like what, you know, what, what you said about, you can't, you can't address the thing they said before, you know, 
I mean, you, you can litmus test that, that, right? Because you have to know, well, maybe it is just like a surface level objection and then I can just resolve it and move on. But a lot of the times you do that litmus test and what you realize is, oh, no, no, there's something bigger here. So then you do what you just said, that that perspective shift of like, well, you're, you're right. I can't guarantee that it'll work for you. But what I can guarantee is that if you don't do it, this is what's going to happen. So highlighting or reminding them the cost of inaction. It's just moving their attention to something else, like the pain instead of the benefit or, or whatever, whatever it is. Um, but I use that all the time. Like I, I never try to resist with objections. So if someone says like, it's just really expensive, like yeah, it is really expensive and it's really expensive because of this. And then I always have like something to come up with. And this might be good for those of you who have the money objections. So I don't think we talked about this. I always say, you're right. It is really expensive. And there's a reason why the more that I charge, um, the more time resources and money I dump into the program but I would also have a program that has less people in it so that I can give you more attention. If I move this to 5,000 or I move this to $2,000, my margins can be so slow that I need a huge amount of people in there. So would you rather have a lower price point and have less handholding, less support, less questions answered, or would you rather pay a little bit more and have a top tier program that's by your side the entire time? So I always right. have like some sort of reason as to why, but Oh, I never try to disagree with them when they have an objection. I always lean into it for sure. Love it. Love it. Um, okay. So the, the last little thing that we have here um, is about like rambling. And this isn't really an objection, but it's something that you have to overcome because sometimes you get on these calls and people just ramble and they talk and they talk nonsense. And you're like, where the hell is this even going? And a lot of people sometimes just let them talk. But, and they go on rabbit holes just like you and I did. Yeah, all over. If you were a good salesperson here, they would like totally knock us back on track. Yeah. <laughs> and so I had, I, you know, I've had people where they start talking about like their political agendas and all of this stuff. And it's semi related to their message, but then they're going off. And I'm just like, let's get back to the freaking program, you know? So how, how do you handle this? Or what have you done? Or what have you learned on this topic? I have this too, where sometimes people, I don't know why, but even when I'm on sales calls for NGM plus, I have people telling me about their childhood traumas. And I'm like, what, how did I get here? How did we get here? Why are we talking about this right now? So first of all, you know, I think people are a little bit afraid to interrupt because it's not, it's, it's rude, but I interrupt people. I interrupt and I was like, okay, hang on, hang on, hang on. And the reason why I do that is because I only have 45 minutes on the calendar. There's someone else booked right after this. And if I let this person continue rambling, I'm not going to find out if I can actually help them, which is the worst outcome of a sales call. Worse than not closing is not knowing if you can actually help the person. Right. Yeah. So I interrupt. Did you just interrupt? I just interrupt. Like, and, and we're on Zoom. I'll just like raise my finger. Like, okay, wait, 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 wait. Let me get, let, let, let me get back to what we were talking about. I, I just like have no qualms about it. I interrupt. And sometimes when I'm trying to ask a question and I feel like I've asked this question three times and I still haven't gotten an answer because that happens too, right? Where you ask, okay, what is the problem you're dealing with in your business? And then the person goes on all these millions of tangents about all the problems they've ever had in their entire life. Right. And I can't solve all of these. <laughs> so sometimes you have to reframe your questions. You have to move their attention to something else. Rather, instead of the problem, you have to move their attention to something else because maybe that way you can get relevant information out of them. Well, that's so important too. And this is another um, parenting hack from the Rachel and Brandon hour. But that's what I do with my kids all the time is like when my communication doesn't get the result that I want, whether it be like to get your chores done or the information that I want, then I make it my responsibility to ask a different question. And it's the same thing with like the prospects. So like with my kids, I, instead of saying you know, like an example might be like, how was your day today? And they're like, Oh no, whatever. Like how kids do sometimes it's just when they're tired. You can ask a different question. Like what's one thing that you're really happy about today? Or what's one thing that really made you mad today? And then now you get, you're going to get a completely different sort of answer. And it's the same thing with like your prospects. 
and you can start to ask them, like, what problems are you dealing with today? And they go off on a tangent. You're like, okay, um, if I can wave a magic wand and fix one thing in your business, what would that be? And then now you're going to get a totally different answer, but you're still getting to the same end goal, which is understanding what their problems are. So I love that. Just like switching the questions around. I also love that parenting analogy. That's so good. I do that too, but I didn't really put it together that that's what I'm doing until you just said it. Yeah. Well, I can teach you a thing or two about parenting if you want, Rachel. Yeah, I, you do. You I, do I have, all the time. I have a one-on-one, sir. We can do consulting if you want. I'll, I'll give you can my Can we rate. barter? <laughs> I'll send you some messaging. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, cool. And then you mentioned something about the different um, syntaxes that you can use during this as well. So explain that. So there, generally speaking, there are two ways to go about the discovery phase of your pro, of your sales call. So what we do in our business generally is called problem, problem aware, right? Problem syntax. Like we focus on the problems that you're having also because this goes in line with how we teach messaging. This is, you know, th- this just is a good fit for us specifically in our business. And I would say for most people, it's probably a better fit, but it kind of depends on your niche. It depends if you're B2B or B2C. So you guys have to kind of explore this on your own, depending on your business. But a different way to go about the discovery phase is not the focus so much on the problem, rather focus on the goal. Where is it that you want to be and why are you not there? So it's still getting good info that you're later going to use, but it's from a different angle. Yeah. And the thing I mentioned to you even before the podcast was like, that's still problem focused. Like when you say here, what do you want to be at? Okay. And why aren't you there? What they're going to start to do is explain what they think the problem is. But it, like you said, the key is, is it's not an angle starting at the problem. It's an angle starting at the desire or end result, but leads you to the problem, which is, which is great. It's just a different angle. And that's usually that's what all it is, is they just need a different context or angle or something to the same theme or topic to get to, to the end, to be able to pull it. So um, okay, great. I mean, I don't have anything to add there either. I, I just do the same thing as you is just interrupt, um, and bring them back. And then honestly, like if they just keep getting off tangent and I just end the call, I'm like, well, I don't, yeah, like I'm, that's great and stuff. And it sounds like you got it figured out. Cause usually what happens is they start rambling and they, a lot of the people that start rambling end up rambling their way to what they think they should be doing. Have you ever happened to you? They're like, well, my problem is this and this and this, and I've tried this and this and this, and I think I just need to do this. And then you can tell right away if they're right fit or not. I'm like, yeah, I think you should do that. All right. Well, I don't think you're right for the program because then we're not going to focus on that. Okay. See you later. Peace out. Click. Right. And the other thing, the other danger of allowing people to ramble without you kind of, I don't want to say controlling, but without you taking back the leadership of the call, like this is your job as a salesperson is to lead this call and maintain leadership of the call. So the danger when you don't do that, besides the fact that you're not going to figure out if you can actually help this person, which is a big, big problem. Also, you, you get friend zoned. So they stop seeing you as an authority or someone who's going to lead them. They stop following you and they start relating to you like you're my buddy now, right? We, we, I said something that made you laugh and like we joked around and we talked about all these other topics and maybe we connected or maybe we share the same political views or whatever. I don't know. Right. So now you got friend zoned and now you t- it takes away from your ability to then get back into the leadership position of that call. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I know some people are thinking like, well, isn't that good? Isn't it good to like be friends with them? No. Have a connection? no. So explain that. No, Why no, is that no. not good? First, that's not your job. Okay, you are not you are not a coach or a sales person in that position to find friends. You want friends? Go on Bumble BFF and find friends. This is not that position. No, I, I, I get that. I think people would agree to that. But I'm I'm saying, don't people think like, hey, if we can form a friendship, there's a connection, which wouldn't that help with sales? Is where where I was kind of going with it. So yes, you need to develop rapport and you need to build trust. That is true. You don't need to do that to at the expense, right? It's it's a harmony. You you can't do that at the expense of actually leading someone to make the best decision for themselves. Like that's a disservice. Right. So what I hear you saying is that yes, we need rapport and connection, but coming off and building the rapport and connection through a friend is not the same as rapport and connection as a mentor, coach, or leader. 
Correct. And that's the sort of like rapport that we need. So that makes Correct. a lot of sense. Um, okay, cool. Well, I think this is good enough to wrap up the episode. I think we covered a lot and I feel like we just keep going back to the same objections. And so I don't know what other objections like may come up, but I feel like everything that we talked about will help you overcome anything that really comes up. Um, is there anything you want to add, Rachel, that you think we missed? No, I don't think we, I don't think we missed anything. I mean, obviously we can go down the rabbit hole of sales for a long time and we do, you need, this is a skill. This is a skill you have to have. And you have to get your brain around this. If you don't like selling, if you don't want to be on sales call, you do what you got to do to get yourself on board with. You're a with business owner. It's a personal yeah. brand. You need, you need yeah. to sell. And I think that's in this space, there's so many people that need a swift kick in the ass and a reminder of this is a freaking business. If you don't want to run a business, you don't want to generate sales. You don't want to like hustle when you need to hustle or do the things that make you uncomfortable stop trying to grow a business and go do something else. And it doesn't mean get a job, but like just go on YouTube, create content, run AdSense and just like making money that way. But like, if you're, you know, want to really grow a course or service based business program, business, this is what, especially in a personal brand, it's like, you got to be able to focus sales. And I always encourage you to do the sales in the beginning. Cause that's just going to allow you to understand your messaging and your people so much more. And you can carry that same language into your webinars, your sales mechanisms and, and all that stuff. So, um, Rachel, I appreciate you so much for coming on here. Uh, first of all, I appreciate you presenting the idea of even doing this series. I think it turned out great. I love it. Um, thank you for spending the time to do it with us and thank you for all the help with the sales that you're doing. So it's my you. pleasure. Thank you for giving me an opportunity to do what I love to do. Yeah, of course. And for those of you guys that are still listening, have not left us a review on iTunes, head over and do that now and let me know if you like this series, um, cause we can do more of this. I can have Rachel back on. You can also send me a note if you're like, I really liked it, but that Rachel gal just could, did not enjoy her at all. Or I really enjoyed her and I hated you, Brandon. Maybe Rachel should have her own podcast. Let me know as well. Um, it'd be really cool to hear that. Just send me an Instagram message and I will see you all next week for another episode. Take care, everyone. Hey guys, thank you so much for checking out another episode of the New Generation Entrepreneur Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, go below, hit the subscribe button, and make sure you click on that bell icon and get notified every time we drop a new episode. Now, if you're looking for the show notes, we have them linked underneath this video, as well as our social media handles and some links to free training and offers that we drop from time to time to help you guys even further. So go check those out if you're interested. And thank you so much for tuning in to the New Generation Entrepreneur Podcast.